Make sure your name's on it and go ahead and pass them over to the left. And then if Molly and Zach, you can use this desk and then you guys use this one. Just put them on there. All right. Let's go ahead and look at this real quickly. I want to do some immediate feedback for you so you can see if you got it right or not and then just kind of work. We're going to be doing a lot of this formula rearrangement this year. And so if you're uncomfortable with this, if you need some help with Algebra, algebra 1, then um, it would be important for you to kind of get that now or at least refresh your memory on how to do some of this stuff. So this first one, this is the formula for converting from degrees Celsius into Kelvin. It's a temperature scale that we're going to be using in here. And so Kelvin is equal to the degrees in Celsius plus 273.15. So how do I re rearrange that to solve for Celsius? Go ahead. Right, subtract that from both sides. And that would give me K minus 273.15. Now I tend to cross my sevens, just so you all know that. Minus 273.15 equals Celsius, or written the other way, Celsius equals K minus 273.15. The second one, T is equal to A divided by B, rearrange the solve for B. Maybe you're more familiar with seeing it written directly over, but um, typing text makes it a little bit difficult to do that, so that diagonal slash is the same as over. And so all we're going to do here is rearrange, there's a shortcut method, right? What's the shortcut for doing this? The shortcut is sliding across the equal sign, diagonally. So you can always slide across the equal sign diagonally. That's a shortcut. The long cut, the long way to do this, is T equals A over B. In order to solve for B, I need to get B in the numerator, right? How do I do that? Well. I'm going to multiply both sides by B. Over here, you could go B cancels B, right? And I'm left with B T equals A, and then divide both sides by T. That'd be one way to do it. Again, this, there's multiple different ways you could do this solution. There's T equals A over B. Right? So if I multiply both sides by B, I get A equals TB. And then to solve for B, I divide both sides by T. T's cancel, and B is A over T. Now this one you should be very familiar with. What's that formula, y equals mx plus B? All right, slope intercept, right? It's form a line. So when you're graphing a line, it has the, if it's a straight line, it has the form y equals mx plus b, where m is the slope and b is the y-intercept. Okay. So solving for x, we have y equals mx plus b. Now when I say to solve for x, what we're trying to do is get x all by itself on one side of the equal sign. Yes, sir? Mm-hmm. Multiply by A? I thought you would multiply by the denominator to eliminate it. Is that what you mean? Yeah. And that's what we did by. So talk me through it then, Zach. You have T equals A divided by B. If you don't mind, what, did you, what would you do next? Okay. Okay. So if you wanted to get rid of the a, is that your, what you're trying to do, or you're trying to get rid of? If you get rid of the a, you could do that by multiplying by one over a. But that would give you t over a is equal to one over b. Okay. Well, then I could just flip it. If I, if I do the inverse of both sides, 
that the a over t is equal to b over 1, which is the same as b, which is what we have over there. See, multiple ways to get to the same thing. Okay. Let's go back to our y equals mx plus b. Solving for x, remember, all I'm trying to do then is get x all by itself on one side of the equal sign. So when y equals mx plus b, trying to get x by itself, first I'm going to look for the easy stuff, the low, the low hanging fruit, the additions and subtractions. Get those out of the way first. So what I'm going to do is subtract b from both sides. And I get y minus b is equal to mx. Then again, I'm trying to get x all by itself on one side of the equal sign. I don't have x. I have m times x. So I perform the opposite operation with the same thing. m over mx divided by m. If I divide both sides by m, m cancels m. And x is equal to y minus b divided by m. And each one of these is a little bit more difficult. This is subtraction only. This is multiplication and division only. This is multiplication, division, and addition subtraction. And then down here, we've got an embedded term. So it's 5 ninths times the quantity f minus 32. So let's walk through that one real quickly. c equals 5 ninths quantity f minus 32. This is one of the formulas for this chapter. What this is telling me, if I am looking for whatever the degrees Celsius, the temperature is, and I know the degrees Fahrenheit, I can compute that. I can figure that out with the formula 5 ninths times the amount of Fahrenheit degrees minus 32. Let's think about it for a minute. At what, at what temperature Celsius does water freeze? Zero degrees Celsius, that's equivalent to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So if I have 32 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 minus 32 is 0. And 0 times anything is 0. So that checks. My freezing point at 32 degrees Fahrenheit is equivalent to 0 degrees Celsius. What does water boil at? In Celsius, what is it? Just tell me. 100 degrees Celsius. And in Fahrenheit, 212. OK, so let's plug in 212, because that's our Fahrenheit, right? What's 212 minus 32? 180, good, 180. 5 ninths times 180. Well, that reduces down to 1 and 20, right? And 5 times 20 is 100. So that's how we compute the degrees Celsius using this formula. Now, 100 degrees and 0 degrees are easy, but there's you know, an infinite number of points between those two. So, so if we're trying to rearrange to solve for f, the first thing we have to do here is not add or subtract, but to get rid of this coefficient. So we do that by multiplying by the inverse. 5 ninths times, we're going to multiply this whole thing then by 9 fifths. Same over here. So 9 fifths Celsius equals Fahrenheit minus 32. Because something times its reciprocal is always equal to 1. Then, to get Fahrenheit by itself, I need to do what? Okay. Add 32. All right, so plus 32, plus 32. And Fahrenheit, then, is equal to 9 fifths Celsius plus 32. Now, let's try it. Again, the freezing point of water is 0 degrees Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. If I plug a 0 in for Celsius, this whole term becomes 0. 0 plus 32 is 32. At 100 degrees Celsius, the boiling point of water, if I plug 100 in there, I get 180 for this term. 9 fifths times 100, 5 and 20, 9 times 20 is 180, plus 32 gives me 212. That's my Fahrenheit. See? So we usually memorize one formula. In this case, the Celsius equals 5 ninths quantity Fahrenheit minus 32. But you may get a problem that says, given Celsius, solve for the other. So you need to be able to take one formula 
and solve it for any variable in that formula. And again, algebra 9, ninth grade algebra. So you guys look a little bit intimidated, but I'll tell you, last in, in the second edition, they started chemistry with thermodynamics, and thermodynamics is all formulas. And so people are like, oh, sunk on it. So, I mean, I'm telling you now, you're going to need some of this algebra right away. You're going to need more of it as we go. So this will be a math refresher as well for some of you. Hopefully not too much. But, but if you need help with the math as well, let me know. Um, math and science are kind of my things. So right now, this isn't a, a whoa, Mr. Baker's impressive or anything, but I tend to do math pretty quickly in my head. I tend to do some estimations that are really close. You can ask the other classes. I don't do it as a, sh as a pride thing, a show-off thing. Just that's something I can do. God gave me that ability. But I do it sometimes real rapidly up here so we can keep moving, so you can see it. I'm not doing it so I can get the ooh-ah from the back of the classroom. Okay, that's not it at all. Um, but hopefully, too, I'll show you how I do some of these processes. Like, you may have already seen me do it here. I just thought about it, you know. The 5 ninths times 100 or 180, how did I come up with reducing the... When I see this, in my mind, I already see that. I just, it takes me longer to write it than it does for me to see it. So that's where some of the, I'm already hopefully ahead of my writing. So sometimes I get caught up. Same thing with my speech impediment. I have a speech impediment and occasionally it'll come out really severely. I'll, I'll kind of collect myself and go back. I was told when I was your age to make sure that I never did anything that involved speaking in front of people. <laughs> okay, so apparently that's not a showstopper for me. Um, but at the same time, sometimes I get excited, sometimes I don't have enough sleep, there are a few other things that bring it on, and then I'm just stumbling over my words. So I may just stop, start again. Because if I'm not thinking ahead of my words, it turns into a nightmare for all of us. So let's see what we're doing today. Today we're talking about matter, and does it? Does matter matter? Some definitions, you guys are already working on these. Chemistry, you've already learned that chemistry is the study of matter. Anything that has matter, and of course the pun is anything that matters, is chemistry. The second definition in there is for matter. What is matter? It's anything that has mass and takes up space. So the textbook gives us our first two definitions right off. Now what's that has mass and takes up space? It's the study of matter, and matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. And so we could say, by bringing these two definitions together, that chemistry is the study of anything that has mass and takes up space. Now, just right now, as you look around yourself, where is the closest piece of matter to you? What's, what's the closest piece of matter? Not your physical person and not at your desk. What's the closest piece of matter to you? The door? OK. This is a pregnant pause intended for you to think for a minute. Derek, is, is the, does he matter? Derek, do you matter? Are you matter? Yes to both, sir. You matter and you are matter. Let me ask you this question then. I always love the beginning of chemistry when I say, hmm. Do fish know they're in water? Now, my daughter is the pet whisperer, so she could probably tell me what, she thinks she could tell me what um, animals think, things like that. But think about it for a minute. Do you think fish know they're in water? Or do they more appropriately know when they're not in water? Is, is in water the normal state and out of water the abnormal state for them? It is, right? And the fact of the matter is we tend to think that which is normal, we take it for granted. We don't think about it. See, part of what we're going to be discussing here is the fact that you are surrounded by matter. You have matter as close to touching you right now, because I've already said nothing actually touches anything, but as close to touching as possible, right now you are completely enveloped in matter. 
Do you believe me? Like, what am I talking about, guys? Are you sitting in the middle of a vacuum? You can hear me, right? If you can hear me, we're not in a vacuum. There's something between you and me that's receiving the energy from my voice and transmitting it to you. What is that thing that's between us? Air. Air is between us. There is matter between us. Now, we can't see it. So, of course, in our minds, it doesn't exist, right? Or does it exist, but we just don't have the correct mechanisms to see it? See? Matter exists. Air. Air exists. I hope you don't want to argue that one. Does air exist? Let's go ahead and take a minute. Now, we're going to do a couple quick experiments. They're similar to the ones in the book, but like I said, we've got some equipment that people from the book don't have. And so we're going to start with asking this question. Very, very basic experiment. It should be almost intuitive, like, I can't believe we're doing this. But if you start with the intuitive, easy stuff, and we build from there, okay? So the question is to determine if air has mass. Because if air has mass, it's something. And in a moment, we're going to ask, does air have volume? So purpose of experiment 1-1, one, one. on your lab write-up, you would write, this would be your purpose statement. It's in your book as well, to determine if air has mass. Question, does air have mass? So we're determining, the purpose for doing the experiment is to determine the question we're actually asking. Does air have mass? Hypothesis, pick one. On your own, right now, you have to, before you see it, and again, this is kind of simple, but does air have mass? Either it does or it doesn't. Choose. Write down what you think. Excuse me for a minute while I go and get my play stuff. This is a triple beam balance. A triple beam balance is what we use to measure mass not weight. We'll get into the difference later. This is not measuring the weight. This is measuring the mass. I know it's not level. I apologize for that. Actually, let me get a level table. It's going to impact our, our readings. Will it? We can calibrate it out. Let's go ahead and do that. We can calibrate out the error caused by the, the angle of the desk. And I'm going to use ballpark because we've got a short period today, so I'm not going to get exact. We're going to do approximate. Okay. So hopefully you agree with me. We've got a triple beam balance, and we've got Miss Bloyd's kindergarten class's beach ball. I brought it from her this morning. And what we're going to do is we are going to determine whether or not air has mass, because right now, though it's not a pure vacuum in that beach ball, will you agree with me that though there may be some air, there's very little air in there? And I have right now on this triple beam balance, it indicates that this beach ball has a mass of 64.8 grams. Okay, so 64.8 grams. That is my beginning mass of the beach ball alone. So, if air has mass, then when I add air to the beach ball, what should happen to its mass? Now, I would give this to some of you, but I know you're full of hot air and it would float, so I'm going to use my air. Plus, I brought it, and so if you break it, then I've got to replace it, so I might as well do it. Same beach ball we took the mass of before, but now it has some of my air, my air, forever encapsulated there 
in memory. Okay, my error. What happens when I put it back on the balance? It has a greater mass. Now, does it have much greater mass? Well, let's see, that might be too much. And again, we're expediting today, so actually, that's pretty good. It's now at 65.48. 65.48 grams. I'm going to run it to 5. So 65.5 grams. I had a mass initially of the relatively empty beach ball at 64.8 grams. I filled it up, and it now has a mass of approximately 65.5 grams. So what is the mass of the beach ball? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Eventually, that's the way it's going to come back. Not right now in your notes, but when you turn it in later, this is going to be a, a homework assignment. It'll be in the right form. You've seen the experiment. You write down this information, right? Now, how many grams of air are in here? If I have a beach ball with no air and then a beach ball with air, the difference between the two masses is, I'm sorry? 0 .7. 0 .7. 0 .7. Seven grams. I cross my zeros, I cross my sevens, I'm sorry. We'll all get used to that. I almost can't do it sometimes, even when I try. So I have 0.7 grams of matter in this beach ball that wasn't there before. That came from the air that I put in there. So does air have mass? Is it matter? Yes, it is. So what we're in the middle of right here, this space, when I move my hand, you can feel it, right? What is it that you feel? Your, your matter is impacting other matter. There's matter in the room. One of the most common mistakes is thinking that there's nothing in the room. The whole, the whole fields of aerodynamics and fluid dynamics are based upon the fact that there's something between us. We live in the realm of, of aerodynamics. Our fish friends live in the world of you know, fluid dynamics, but they're very similar. And a lot of the principles work in both of them because we're actually moving all the time when we're walking. We are the equivalent of fish swimming in the tank. We just don't think about what's around us. And if we don't think about the air around us, maybe fish don't think about the water around them either. Okay? So we ask the question, does air have mass? This would indicate that it does. Next experiment deals with the idea of, does air take up space? Does air take up space? And what are we trying to prove? The same thing. We're determining, that's the purpose. The question is, does it? Let me move the beach ball on the scale away. This experiment's relatively simple, and it's very qualitative. Qualitative and quantitative. A qualitative is kind of a, a general idea and we'll get into the definitions later for this. But quantitative is very specific. Both of these experiments are pretty qualitative. They're just general. I rounded off the masses. And this one is just observe the principle, OK? Water, beaker, big beaker, little beaker, big beaker with water, small beaker with paper. Does air take up space? Now, if I take. Your hypothesis, does it or doesn't it? You need to write that down. Pick one. Either air does or air does not take up space. Write down what you think. Here's what I'm going to do. In the speaker, I placed a piece of paper. That's not a real bell, right? I think we're here till 10.50. Or excuse me. Let me check. I've got it written down because today's schedule is all wonky. It is a real bell. We're, let's do this real quickly. What's going to happen when I take this speaker and stick it in this water? What's going to happen to the paper? It's going to absorb. 
Is it? No. It's dry. Why is it dry? The air takes up space and kept the water from filling the space, which is why if I tilt it too far and you see blub, 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 then it'll get wet because the air that's taking up the space around it's no longer there to take up the space and the water will take up the space. Okay. And, yeah, good point. And in addition to that, we could have just looked at the beach ball and say, hey, the beach ball without air took up less space than the beach ball with air, therefore air must take up space, right?